I know you've been watching the news. I know that uh, you've um, uh, had many feelings and thoughts about what is happening in the world. And one of the great uh, advantages when we gather is that there's a chance to uh, dialogue about things, uh, dialogue about things in an appropriate way as we um, uh, share one uh, with another uh, about uh, uh, how we see things, all that being uh, within the framework of uh, the reading of scripture, uh, prayer and study and love and care for each other. Yeah, the last uh, number of weeks we've been talking about our church community as one that loves one another, serves one another, takes care of one another, forgives one another, encourages one another, and that certainly makes it beneficial. Uh, and these have been good uh, uh, sessions that we've had. But the church, uh, and I'm going to say particularly Central Schwankfelder Church, provides a Christian perspective on issues in the framework of study of the Bible, then the presentation of history from a uh, Christian perspective, uh, then uh, through guidance and prayer by supportive people, and then dialogue with those Christians with whom we know. Um, I'd like to suggest, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, promote today that we shouldn't take these things for granted. Uh, this is part of our heritage. Uh, this is something that ought to be preserved, this ongoing dialogue that we have one with another. It needs to be an informed dialogue, and we just don't want to go off willy-nilly uh, saying uh, whatever, whatever we want, but it's, it's very helpful to have Christian discussion within these parameters. For those of you who know the Schwankfelders, uh, you will remember this word, conventicles. Uh, small Christ, uh, uh, Christians gathering together in small Christian groups, uh, meeting with uh, relatively like-minded individuals, discussing uh, with uh, each other over the Bible about particular uh, matters of the day in light of um, the Christian uh, uh, text and tradition that has been handed down, and then along with uh, prayer support being given. Now you might say, well, isn't that the way that all churches uh, handle things? Actually, no, it's not. Uh, it really doesn't happen like this in a large number of churches, particularly those that are hierarchical. And there's a substantial uh, portion of the body of Christ that does not handle the presentation or the discussion of issues of the day uh, in the way that we do here. So um, I've given you a picture of some cardinals, uh, but it's only to be a, uh, an illustration of substantial portions of the body that are top down. Um, here, uh, the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, you'll even find it in uh, even some uh, uh, free churches uh, that say that they're congregational, but in reality, it comes from the top down. Um, and it would be considered a, an Episcopalian or a Catholic means of, uh, of discussing. Uh, even in some of the large mega churches that say that they're congregational, you will find this viewpoint that is promoted. It's one person at the top who is making uh, declarations rather than having dialogue about them. Now, before being uh, uh, so polarized, I mean, there are blessings and then there are uh, disadvantages of handling things in, that, in these ways. If you are an, from an Anglican or Catholic model, there are advantages to that, such as those with more knowledge of Christian tradition generally make the decision that can be a benefit. It is certainly a benefit that it can be quicker, but a drawback is that it can be top heavy, that it always starts at the top without the ability to process throughout uh, the body of the church. The other side, which is our, the side that uh, we are in as uh, Schwankfelders and Congregationalists today, is that the body has time to, more, to process things more thoroughly. An advantage, it has wider appeal. But a drawback uh, can be is, and I didn't list this, is it can take more time, and the weight of Christian tradition may get swallowed up in uh, so-called democracy. Uh, and I use that word democracy. I know we're Americans. We like that word. Uh, just, uh, the, just a note here is that uh, the church is, let's say, never totally democratic in that it is, there is one head of the church, and that is Jesus Christ uh, himself. So even in a congregational standpoint, we are trying to uh, illustrate as best as we think we could uh, what Jesus would want from the church. Now, you might have some questions, some thoughts, or as good congregationalists, you might even want to discuss what I have to say so far. So I'm going to break it right here and let uh, you have some discussion about 
just the way that uh, um, uh, we dialogue with each other in a congregational tradition before then taking on the topic of racism uh, for a moment. So a thought or a comment or a question from you. Is there any way that we could become Anglican by the end of this uh, Sunday school lesson? <laughs> Now, that, just in case everybody didn't realize that, that's uh, that's our senior pastor, uh, David McKinley, who's who's advocating for that. <laughs> or are you at not advocating? Uh, I I guess I won't lose uh, I won't I won't uh, lose my job being a comedian. I won't even start it. <laughs> the the synod will have a pronouncement on that next week for you. <laughs> we'll be quick. Uh. <laughs> I, I will say, Drake, that uh, you, you, th this is this is a great way to start this lesson, and um, I do think it's one of our church's strengths that uh, we have a, a flatter structure. Um, I think uh, when the church speaks, I'd like to think that it's truly the church speaking. Um, I think as as a Christian leader, it's so easy to get way out in front of something and uh, to get out on a limb and the support of the church, the support of the congregation, uh, the sense that the, that the Holy Spirit is working among us uh, is, a, is a good thing. It's a beneficial thing. Um, of course, you know, um, uh, our, our weaknesses are maybe some things that we can work on, um, you know, uh, you know, speed of decisions and things, but I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail. But, um, you know, here, here's a situation in our country where uh, ample discussion and um, expression is, is very important. And I know that there are um, diverse feelings on, on you know, the, the different facets of, of, this issue that we're even talking about today. So I, I appreciate the way that you've outlined it. Thank you, David. Yes, um, uh, to David's uh, uh, comment, I, I do wonder uh, as, a, as a congregational church, um, how, how do we move forward um, and get ample discussion uh, before we say, this is who we are and this is what we feel about it um and if there's one person that dissents um then what what comes of that and so i've uh, i've been struggling with this uh, as as moderator of the general conference that's that's a very good question uh uh, uh barry and I, I have some some thoughts on that but i think i'm going to save it uh, for the end as i'm going to try and walk through at least how we're working with one current statement, um, and then then maybe we could come back to that at the end. Does that sound okay? Uh, good by you? Yes, fine. It, because it's it, it's not as it, it, it's a little murky. Yeah, I was going to say on there. Even when you look at the uh, the uh, apparent uh, advantage in the in the hierarchical structure, when you have a hierarchical structure like that, and again. We can take either Anglican or Catholic Church. It still winds up uh, sort of at, at its worst, um, degenerating into factionalism or rival groups, and you can see that throughout history uh, on the stuff. And even what's going on with the uh, with the church history today, where you wind up then having more split offs and problems and all that type of thing. So it, it's uh, it looks a uh, nice on the surface but it still leads to similar problems yeah and we could take this entire sunday school to uh uh talk about uh, congregationalism versus uh, anglican uh, catholicism in, in its model uh and perhaps we should do that in a, at a at another time so we can develop the history and how it how it is but it, i think it's important as we try and now move on to uh, to discussing uh, 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 racism and the, some of the questions that have come up this past week that we know the framework that we're operating in and we want to change the framework or, or explore the I should say explore the framework further uh, we can but we've got to do it within at least uh, some reasonable uh, summary of uh, of how um, congregational life uh, works 
which we're in. That's, that's, that's the environment we're in. Let's go on to the next, uh, next one here. And we'll, uh, we have the slides up here. Okay. Uh, and let's talk uh, about racism. I'm going to try and address an issue. I'm going to put uh, a few, uh, try and summarize the news uh, uh, shortly. Some of you probably will want it larger, but I, I, we've got to just try and do it in one slide. And then I'm going to move to a statement that uh, all three of us as pastors have thought about and want to try and now work through a congregation and a denomination. So starting it, but uh, this is a good uh, uh, platform by which we can discuss it, and I'm sure you'll have some ideas. Here's some issues that have come up uh, from uh, George Floyd's death and probably also from uh, uh, the history of racism over the last uh, uh, number of years here in the, in the country. How far does racism extend within society? Um, is each person uh, a racist? Um, is our society racist or are only pockets of it uh, racist? Is there a, sorry, misspelling there. Uh, no, maybe you had, sorry. Right. Uh, is there a systemic racism in the nation or is it in, only in certain areas? Um, I think these are all questions that have come up and are still and say uh, left unresolved. And it's worth having the church, our church or our denomination make some type of statement about this. Uh, but to do so, we have to uh, try and navigate through a congregational means of trying to talk about this. So the three of us as pastors have started this, and I want to thank uh, uh, David for initiating this. But uh, Julian and I have had our uh, 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 contribution that we've made to this. I'm going to read the statement. It comes in several slides, and then I'm going to try and take you to the sources of each of the, the points within it, of which I'll give you opportunity to uh, discuss the sources, because it's always good to go back to the sources. Can, can I can I interrupt just for a moment? By all means, David. Um, I, I have to say that uh, Barry Simpson, our uh, conference moderator, this was uh, something that the Lord pressed upon his heart, and uh, he started um, the, uh, this idea, which I think is, is a good idea. And, uh, the ministerium, yes, has been working on it, but I, I appreciate Barry, uh, getting the ball rolling. I say then, thank you, Barry. Now here's uh, a statement. Isn't that a nice picture of the three of us? Uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. In a day when division seems to rule every issue under the sun, it's time for us to speak out against racism. The recent events in our nation have been tragic. In light of these events, we wish to state the following. We affirm with our nation's founders who wrote the Declaration of Independence that all men and women, regardless of race, are created equal. As a church, we reaffirm the truths of Galatians 3.28 that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. As those who stand in line with the persecuted tradition that emerged from Silesia, Germany in the 16th century, we empathize with black Americans. We support them and all people of color in their struggle for justice and condemn racism in all its forms. May God heal our land and may his son Jesus Christ, who is the, way, the true way to all reconciliation, be lifted up. The Schwenkfelder Church has historically held that individuals should be guided by a prayer-directed conscience and submission to Holy Scripture. We will pray and act to help bring about social justice in our churches and within our land. Okay, so there's a statement. We have processed it as pastors. I want to take you to the sources and explain each of the points in relation to the sources. Um, and perhaps we'll come back to, a, uh, to the statement at the end. Um, and I'm taking notes as we talk because, well, we can always make, uh, uh, or at least um, uh, um, at least have in our minds uh, how we might uh, adjust uh, one way or the other. Any comments somebody wants to make before I work through sequentially Declaration of Independence, Galatians chapter three, and then Schwenkfelder tradition? Let's go. Let's talk through the Declaration of Independence. Supporting the statement, we affirm with the founders of the Declaration of Independence that all men and women, regardless of race, are created equal. 
Well, it's always best uh, to go back to the sources. Uh, ad fontes is uh, in, in Latin, as Dr. Peter Erb would say. So let's go back to the source. And let's read the Declaration of Independence. Uh, maybe you've read it recently. Uh, but I'm going to read the parts that are appropriate to this statement that's been made. Reading there, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected with them one uh, with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And then here's the key thought. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will, in, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shewn, there's a little old English, that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Now, uh, I'm gonna stop it there with uh, the Declaration of Independence, um, but uh, just to summarize uh, the rest of it, there are particular objections that are given to violations from the King of England, and they specifically call him a, a tyrant within the Declaration of Independence. There's also a paragraph and an appeal to British brethren for not hearing the repeated uh, uh, requests and appeals. And then the Declaration concludes with the colonies will now govern themselves. Now, I'm going to return to our statement for a moment because it's in our statement because it affirms the basis of the nation of being equality, equality of all people. And it provides space for the reevaluation of society, uh, which the Declaration of Independence says certainly gives us from 1776 and is worth considering. Um, but uh, by appealing to the Declaration of Independence, uh, we're not uh, um, supporting a revolution uh, or violence or the overthrow of a monarch uh, because that was in 1776 and we're not under that system now. So uh, we're only working with the point of uh, equality of uh, mankind and um, the appro appropriate reevaluation of society uh, as it sees fit. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure you'll have a comment off of that. So um, I'll uh, open the floor uh, for comments for a few minutes, but realize that I'm gonna move on to um, uh, the other sources that make up this statement. So I'm gonna limit uh, discussion if it goes on too long. Okay. Who would like to have a comment or a question first? Pastor Drake, I was just going to say, I th think this is an observation of thinking about when the country realizes that it needs to make a change. I, I thought of the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, that would be another source. Uh, not in this uh, statement, but I'm, I'm certainly not uh, undervaluating that uh, source as being uh, valid for, you know, for where we are today. I, I just want to make a simple comment. I mean, I think that those those words that were penned by initially by Thomas Jefferson, then accepted by the Continental Congress and accepted by our country, are outstanding, and I think that they still apply. I think it's great to be reminded of them. 
uh, I think it's very hard to improve on, on those thoughts that, were, that came out of July 19, 1776. Well, I just want to say that that declaration was written by a group of men that were kind of a, you know, their own little culture, you know, white, successful men on the whole. And many people were left out of that equality for many years, including women. So I just want to point that out. And I know we kept, we've been adjusting this over the years with amendments and whatnot. So, but the original document, the words are wonderful, but the actuality of the time was a little troubled, I think, even back then. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm writing these things down, folks. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I also find it uh, somewhat um, ironic or sad um, when you look at, uh, when we think in terms of history, um, I guess yesterday was the celebration or the services for uh, D-Day. And with all the things we look at for people, again, trying to deal with uh, protection or overthrow a tyranny, um, that sort of got lost in, the, um, in the, the backdrop of all the other things. And yet, there was a lot of people of all different diverse groups um, struggling to um, wind up freeing the French and Europe in general. No more comments? I think that, um, you know, I, I appreciate what uh, Drake the Elder has said, and I appreciate what Trish has said. I think that um, the statement, all men were created equal, I think uh, operates um, in a prophetic way. Uh, it, I think it's pretty amazing that here in 2020, uh, we're, we're dealing with something that is 200, a, a statement where going back to a statement that's you know 250 years old and uh, that it has relevance today uh and um that that as a nation we're really grappling with and uh you know from and i don't know you know some of you don't care about football uh, i don't understand you but um you know <laughs> roger goodell has has you know come out and, and almost kind of recanted uh, his um, reaction uh, to uh, Colin Kaepernick. And uh, I, I think that, you know, however way we, we saw Kaepernick's um, behavior, um, now that's being reevaluated. And I, and I think that, uh, I just think that that's very interesting. And um, I think we're all wrestling with this statement from the declaration and i and i think it's a good wrestling that we're doing so i i guess i'm what i'm uh, struggling with or whatever here we are talking about a statement that's almost 250 years old that's been around and yet we're still in the situation we are after all that time and that seems to be the root of the whole discussion at this point i mean how is it that we're not advancing? What are we doing wrong? And obviously there's lots of things we're not doing right, but how do we get beyond this? How do we be better people? How do we treat everybody more equally? And, and at the time, I agree with Trish with women's rights, but there was also the Native American Indian Wars and and still slavery going on by some of the writers of this declaration. It's a marvelous piece, yes, but um, I guess it's time that we honor it for real. If I can ask the favors a question here uh, in response, when you say we, you mean uh, the American nation or do you mean uh, we as uh, the church or we as uh, the Central Schwenkfelder Church? I, th I see it as both, I, I oh. think, certainly as a country, but I think uh, it's time, I, I think we as a church, should be more proactive. There's been a lot of editorials written recently, and part of this is that we need to call out racism when we see it and, and not sit back. I look at also one thing that uh, you see so much of the stuff, uh, the, the way forward is also putting our emphasis on God rather than going through and relying on individuals changing and trying to change themselves looking at their change 
coming about through uh, through Christ. And that emphasis, even in the part of the declaration, uh, we were quoting, by our creator. So much of what we see going on today, that part is being forgotten. I'm not saying by the church, but if you look at it, as the society has gotten more secularized, you see more and more problems. And it's not just racism, it's a whole bunch of isms that are going across. The Declaration says created equal. God created us equal. It's man-made prejudices that take over from there. God started us off right where we go as a people. Man-made prejudices, I guess I'd say. I think self, self-reflection is good, whether it's an individual or, or church or society. And just like we look back at this document, you know, 250 years old and saying, well, that's the ideal. Why can't we get to that point? It's the same as looking at the Bible, 2000 years old, saying that's the ideal. Why can't we get to that point? Thank you for your comments and, and thoughts on, on this, uh, this first section. Let's uh, see if we can move on and take on the next uh, uh, section. Looking at Galatians 3.28 in context, since that was uh, the part that was uh, quoted. And using this to support, as a church, we reaffirm the truths of Galatians 3.28, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. Uh, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Um, once again, we go back to the sources here, and that means looking at the book of Galatians uh, for a few minutes. Book of Galatians, written by Paul the Apostle, and he wrote this book uh, between AD 48 and AD 55. It might be the first letter that he wrote, um, uh, but in either case, it's certainly one of the earliest. Uh, it depends on whether you believe he's writing to people in South Galatia or in North Galatia. That's another conversation we can have at another time. The point is, it's early and maybe the earliest book that we have in uh, the New Testament. What's happening in the letter? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. You like maps? There's a map. All right. The blue lines there are Paul's uh, missionary uh, journeys uh, and uh, uh, his first missionary journey is in blue. And uh, that you can see he, how he made his way through um, at least South Galatia. I happen to favor that uh, and happen to favor an early date for the book of Galatians. Now, Galatians addresses a false gospel. This should not be uh, lost on us when we're reading uh, 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 the book of Galatians uh, and read these words in Galatians chapter one. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or in trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Wow. Tell us what you think, Paul. <laughs> all right. Uh, and this ought to be noted that uh, this is usually in the pleasantries uh, part of the, of the letter where Paul is uh, giving a, um, and uh, thank you to the Lord and thank you to the church. There's no thank you section in Galatians because he's so upset uh, with what is happening at Galatia. Continuing in the reading of uh, verse nine uh, of chapter one, as we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Wow, what's going on here? Well, it's a church that was predominantly full of Gentiles, but false teachers came in during the day, strongly influenced by Judaism and affirmed circumcision, the worship of certain uh, special days, uh, the eating of certain foods, and the Galatians were accepting this uh, hook, line, and sinker. Um, little fishing analogy there, as they took on this false gospel, and Paul was very upset about it. What happened is that there was a two-tiered uh, situation that was being uh, established in the church uh, in Galatia. Those who held on to uh, the uh, first century Jewish uh, traditions, uh, who were seen as being uh, more superior than those who didn't. And Paul was very worried. Uh, Galatians 1, uh, we already read that, but in Galatians 4, 11, 11, he even says that he thinks that he's wasted his time with them. Now, as somebody who reads a lot of Paul and studied Paul for many years, uh, he doesn't say that very frequently in his letters, uh, but he does say so in Galatians uh, chapter 4. 
the whole thing had to do with uh, faith and works and how somebody uh, becomes a Christian and how somebody is seen as a Christian. So now let me try and read some of the surrounding verses to Galatians uh, 3.28. Picking it up in Galatians 3.1, we read, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supply the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So you can see the, stri- the strong contrast here. Is it by what you're doing or is it by what you're hearing and what you're believing in your heart? Then he moves on to bring up Abraham. For anybody who was Jewish would know that uh, it's all from Father Abraham that uh, we become part of uh, the people of God. So these verses are important in Galatians 3, verse 6 through 9. Starting in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In him, I'm sorry, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith, right? So it's always by faith that you are are part of the family lineage of Abraham and hence a son of God, which he then picks up now at the latter part of Galatians 3 and Galatians 3, uh, 23 through 29. So we read these words, and then I'll let you comment. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, right? Which is, of course, what Paul doesn't want the Galatians uh, to do. You were imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. It's not that the law was evil. It's just with Christ, uh, we're we're getting beyond uh, what first century Jews were celebrating. And until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So that's the key thing. If you're in Jesus, you're a son of God through faith, identifying with Abraham. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And now the verse that is appealed to within the pastoral statement. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Okay, enough for me on uh, Galatians 3. Um, Perhaps you have a comment or a thought that you want to make on um, uh, what has just been uh, set forward. Well, one thing I when, when I read and that's what I mean, even before the statement, I thought of this verse from Galatians about there are you know talk about there's no differences in the body of Christ. I think and I, you may discuss it in a um, in another slide or two, but I I'm, I don't know it wasn't on the listing. Um, that the other verse where when you look about the body of Christ, you have the parts of the body, whether and the eyes not greater than the uh, ears or the feet and the hands and all. And that's the type of thing. But there's unity, even though there's different parts. Mm-hmm. I think that's an important thing, almost as a bookend to the statement in Galatians. Yeah, and that's uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And it is a, another Pauline uh, uh, expression or uh, uh, statement, as, um, as you're rightly pointing out, Bill. I think it's good that it's included. I think it uh, certainly helps give a wider perspective to the full statement. I, I couldn't help but think that um, Paul was mentioning, you know, a different gospel. And um, I think that there are, you know, in some ways, if you look at the different philosophies that people are following and different things, that is a different gospel. And I think that this is so. This is very appropriate for what we're seeing. 
Okay, let's go on to the last part of the statement with the appeal to uh, Schweinfelder heritage and using it as a point to support uh, as those who stand in line with a persecuted tradition that emerged from Silesia, Germany in the 16th century, we empathize with black Americans. We support them and all people of color in their struggle for justice and condemn racism in all its forms. Uh, that'll take us back to uh, our tradition and well, uh, how we fled from Silesia, Germany. Right, and uh, perhaps some of you have seen this plaque. How many, well, I, sorry, it would be easier if we're all together, you know, everybody raised their hands. I mean, a few of you are waving your hands. Okay, that's good, all right? Um, and you can see there the statement, uh, sorry, I'm looking up on the screen here, to the memory of the followers of Caspar von Schwenkfeld, who fled from Silesia and found uh, in Pennsylvania a haven of religious toleration. They landed near this spot, 1731 to uh, 1737. Schwenkfelders fled uh, from Germany, fleeing from religious persecution, and uh, settled here. I mean, that is part of the backdrop and the fabric um, uh, of this church and of, of, this, uh, uh, of this denomination. Were African Americans, uh, and at the same, uh, as I uh, uh, said, so Black Americans, were Black Americans a part of this? Uh, no, actually, uh, they weren't but it is something that we can do to empathize with, not just sympathize, uh, but empathy, try to um, have heartfelt appreciation and uh, potential um, uh, action as uh, best as possible within um, uh, a, a prayerful and reflective uh, uh, evaluation of each, uh, of each uh, standpoint. But for some of you uh, who uh, don't know, uh, we've been connected with uh, churches in the city for quite some time. The first Schwenkfelder Church in um, the Strawberry Mansion uh, section of the city on 30th and Cumberland. We've had longstanding uh, relationship uh, from, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, that church, uh, particularly uh, during the times uh, when uh, there were questions or problems uh, with um, uh, with race uh, in the in the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, we have had connections with uh, the Brookers, uh, with uh, um, uh, Reverend Brooker, who has still has uh, the deepest uh, bass voice that I've I've ever uh, I ever can remember. Uh, tall uh, gentleman, uh, quite um, uh, energetic and enthusiastic. Um, his uh, successor was uh, a brother who I have pictured here, Reverend Edward Winslow, uh, knew who I knew quite uh, well. Um, and uh, Ed eventually went on to uh, found the Schwenkfelder Missionary Church in um, which moved to 20th and Reed Streets where it was meeting in a funeral home. It is Reverend Alfred Duncan, who unfortunately I do not have a picture of, uh, but uh, he was, um, uh, he is uh, Ed's successor and continues now the work of the Schwenkfelder Missionary Church in the Germantown area of the city. Uh, over these uh, last several days, we as pastors have been in touch uh, with these um, uh, uh, brothers of ours uh, in, uh, at uh, uh, the Schweikfelder Missionary Church, and then I've had uh, contact with uh, several at now the first worship center, which is the picture in the upper right-hand corner, uh, which uh, was uh, the first Schweinfelder Church. Uh, uh, they're glad for our uh, contact uh, with them. Uh, they're glad for our prayerful participation with them. Um, and uh, we uh, continue on trying to help as best uh, as we can uh, in those, uh, those circumstances. But it's been helpful over the years to uh, be helping uh, the um, issue of racism by actually partnering with uh, those who are right in the center of it. So, so we're listening uh, to uh, our, our brothers and sisters there and trying to help as best as possible. Now, perhaps you have a comment uh, or a thought here before I reread the statement and then uh, make a suggestion on where the statement goes and then uh, how we as pastors are continuing to work on the, the matter of racism. Comment or a thought at this point? Uh, I'll, I'll just say, Drake, that... Um... You know, in my short time here at the church, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty homogenous um, place, um, Nevada, Missouri, uh, population of around 10,000 people when I grew up there in the, in the late 80s and uh, graduated from high school. Um, there was one African-American person in the whole town. Uh, Leon was his name. And, and uh, 
I got to know him and many others did too. And he ha had a very good reputation. Um, but our, our exposure to racial diversity was, was limited. And then I, uh, my first full-time pastor in, in a little town in, uh, of Pleasanton, Kansas, um, south of Kansas City there had, uh, it, it, was, it was pretty Caucasian uh, through and through. And so when I came to Central, um, of course I was exposed, I had, I had a roommate that was African-American at, uh, at college and, um, but I, I was so blessed to experience people like Ed Winslow who I saw really as a, a tremendous bridge builder. Um, you know, Ed loved me, took an interest in me. He loved our church. Uh, he said, you know, uh, I, I want Central to be my home church. Um, uh, he, he was just, um, I, I saw him as just an incredible person. And he could have been um, bitter over maybe some things that he experienced throughout his life, but there wasn't any racial bitterness in him whatsoever. And uh, I think that that's a credit to him. I think that, um, you know, and, and his wife, Charlotte too, uh, deeply loved our church and the people of our church and we loved him. Um, but I, I appreciate seeing his picture there on the slide. Would it be worth, seeking input from Pastor Duncan on the statement, just to, not necessarily to ask for revisions, but just to get his impression on it. Oh, we, we have. He's been included from the very beginning. Now, I think that, um, you know, both he and William Hamilton, I think that they have lots going on in their in their lives right now, but they've been consulted from the very beginning. You're anticipating us a little bit uh, uh, with this, Jim, as I'm, I'm going to share with where that's, this statement's going to go, but yes. Um, Very sobering topic. Yeah, I would agree. Well, maybe I'm gonna reread the statement um, and then I'm going to uh, suggest where it goes um, uh, next. Um, In a day when division seems to rule every issue under the sun, it is time for us to speak out against racism. The recent events in our nation have been tragic. In light of these events, we wish to state the following. We affirm with our nation's founders who wrote the Declaration of Independence that all men and women, regardless of race, are, are created equal. As a church, we reaffirm the truths of Galatians 3.28, then in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. As those who stand in line with the persecuted tradition that emerged from Silesia, Germany in the 16th century, we empathize with black Americans. We support them and all people of color in their struggle for justice and condemn racism in all its forms. May God heal our land and may his son, Jesus Christ, who is the true way to all reconciliation be lifted up. The Schwenkfelder Church has historically held that individuals should be guided by a prayer directed conscience in submission to Holy Scripture. We will pray and act uh, to help bring about social justice in our churches and within our land. Well, I, I guess um, I'd just like to say that um, the comparison between different churches in different areas, um, our church being predominantly white and raised, you know, amongst mainly white people, and Julie's church in New York City being predominantly black and just only having not that many white people there. And a lot of inner... Um, marriages, um, one black person, one white person, and um, still the, the, um, the racial injustice, I guess you could say, runs deep, even in with married couples, because as white people, it's very difficult for us to understand what the, an the ancestors of the, the black people went through. Um, because they are two different cultures. And um, I just want to say that I, I feel like God knows what he's doing. And this is something that probably should have been brought 
I mean, our country's been striving for racial equality for the longest time, I guess, since Martin Luther King. And, um, but it's obvious that it, 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 it's still, there's still a lot of racial tension in, in what happened. And um, now it's not only um, an issue in the, in the United States, but it, this is being seen worldwide what has happened here in the United States. And it's really, it really brought this to the forefront that it needs to be stopped. And, um, you know, at a point where with this pandemic, where everyone was, their tensions were high being stuck at home, you know, and not being able to see their friends and everything that's going on. Um, and people's people were, you know, um, stressed to begin with, and then to have this happen, and then this whole, this whole thing, it, it, um, you know, it's just, uh, I think it's, I think it's going to have, uh, there's going to be a good outcome from it, and uh, we don't know, um, our ways are not God ways, God's ways, but um, I just will say that God knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether um, I heard this um, recently from uh, one of the pastors, but um, there is a, a quote uh, from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He made it in uh, first in December 18th in 1963, and his statement was then, the most segregated hour in this nation is Sunday at 11 a.m. And that gets to a lot of the of the issues that where it is incumbent upon the, the the various churches to stop thinking themselves as churches and get back to the again to the the spirit and thought of Galatians. All right, where does the statement go to the ministerium where we are uh, close to achieving uh, uh, full support uh, uh, with this? We've already had some uh, uh, dialogue already. Uh, uh, as David has mentioned, but then it would go on next to the executive council and then subsequently uh, to individual church councils. David, do you have any comments you want to make on that or uh, Barry? Well, I'll just say that um, I, I think the obvious to have words on a paper is one thing, to have action is another. Yes. I think that uh, to, to, to be an intentionally inclusive group uh, regarding racism is uh, important. Um, I think to value our relationships that we already have with our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, that are of um, um, uh, African American background is important. I think uh, as as white Christians, we we need to listen. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're living in a time of reaction, and so. Maybe uh, James one nineteen to to speak less and listen more is important, um, because I haven't lived. Um, you know, I as I was having this conversation with Drake uh, earlier. You know, I I went to a good high school, a good grade school, good middle school, and then uh, had the 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 blessing and the privilege of uh, going. Uh, to more schooling after that and uh, I was given a tremendous launch pad and um, there are those in our country that um, have never had any type of launch pad and um, and, and yeah uh, there's incredible value to hard work um, but if you if you remember some of the discussions that we've had say for instance with um um oh drake help me um the evangelist the down in uh, germantown that we uh love dearly i can't remember his name right now he uh, just Melvin floyd? mel floyd um you know when when his daughter and son-in-law came to this church and spoke uh, of some of the issues that uh, the black community is wrestling with in Philadelphia um, and, and the attitude. Um, and and I, I say, you know, there's many 
there's lots of tentacles to this. And, and some of the tentacles are legitimate and some are illegitimate. Um, and I don't want to get political here, but uh, I was watching a, a speech uh, by a young African-American lady, Candace Owens, last night. And she brought up some, some points that I think are being overlooked as well. So I, I think um, a comprehensive listening on this subject of race in our country and what we do now is, is crucial. David, uh, and perhaps I can then uh, add on to this that uh, we are planning on doing this uh, on our podcast uh, this next uh, Wednesday. Uh, where we'll have Reverend Alfred Duncan from the Schweigfelder Missionary Church and then uh, Keith Williams, who's uh, pictured on the right uh, there. Uh, both are, are, have been uh, willing to come and, uh, and uh, help speak to us about uh, racism and reconciliation. And David and I and Jeff will all be involved in, in, in taping uh, some of that. Uh, so look for that uh, uh, coming out uh, in the future. Oh, is there a hand? Barry had a comment. Oh, Barry had a comment. I'm sorry, Barry. Um yeah, so I, again, I want to th uh, thank uh, uh, David for uh, taking the lead on this and for the input from all the pastors that uh, uh, and, and others that uh, have been uh, incorporated into the thinking here. Um, uh, there is the possibility that as we move f forward, um, there will be some people who say, well, uh, there's there's more to social injustice than just racism, and and then they may tick off uh, a number of of socially hot issues. Um, uh, I I would like I would like this to uh, uh, endure uh, any attempt to sort of bundle it into other social issues. Let it stand on its own, um, and uh, hopefully. Uh, it would be a vehicle that we uh, we can make progress with. Thank you, Barry. I would agree with that. Uh, let's 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 hope that it makes uh, makes a good way forward. We're at about uh, half past here. Any final comments or thoughts on this? Your thoughts are certainly welcome. Thank you all for for initiating this. Sometimes the. Uh... Uh, the, 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 the greatest times of growth are out of uh, discomfort. And, um, and, and I, I know that uh, this is causing so many of us to think, and I think that's a good thing. Going forward with the staff is, and the curriculum for teaching young children, is there a revised curriculum to include um, racism issues or how to talk to the sensitivity or how to talk with the children and that comes from us through emily who's been doing some research on how to talk to young children from two years old to five years old and then uh what's appropriate from that age to the next age group but um the curriculum out that we can use at the church working with the young children through Awana or Sunday school programs. Which to some might be a hot topic of, is this taught at home or is it taught at church or is it both? Who, who best to teach this? School, church, really should start at home, shouldn't it? Well, I think, I think, I think racism is a learned uh, is something that's learned. I, I mean, basically, I think that young children, especially, are pretty much colorblind. They don't they don't look at the color of each other's skin. It's I, I really think it's learned. It's a learned behavior. Um, that's all. Well, I I, I would agree, uh, Allie. I, I I think, and there, there's there's many ways that a person learns racism um you know we're we're i think it's human nature to be afraid of what we're um of what's different uh to be apprehensive anyway um but to answer your question karen i i think already uh there has been some some good things done i don't think that our church is in the dark on this regarding uh youth and young people i think that 
Julian has addressed it before. I think Brian Neunschwander is addressing it now. Um, you know, I praise God for Brandon Martin, who's uh, a youth advisor, and he's been a youth advisor for several years now. I know that they've had uh, Zoom conversations uh, with our young people and have talked about race. Um, I think that, uh, you know, and, and this is a controversial subject because I think that it invokes different reactions. Some reactions are, are anger and some reactions are, are passionate and other reactions maybe are more deliberate or maybe even tempered. But um, uh, I, I think, and, and I'd like to think that our curriculum is always being, always evolving and, and trying to get better. Um, uh, you know, we have, uh, so maybe I ought to stop right there, but I, I think you bring up a good point and I think that um, it is and, and, and will continue to be. Thank you, David. Thank uh -huh. you. Sure. We're at, uh, we're over time here, so I think we need to uh, bring this uh, to an end, but uh, thank you for uh, being a part of uh, this uh, Zoom uh, Sunday School experience. So we still will be listening to your thoughts on a statement like this, and uh, certainly uh, through um, uh, various uh, councils involved with uh, uh, the denomination and our church. So don't hesitate to um, uh, reflect uh, further and to, uh, and to give a voice, uh, but hopefully this is at least a, a starting point uh, for, for trying to um, um, uh, address uh, uh, racism uh, in our day. David, could I ask you to close us in prayer? Would you be willing to do that for us? Be happy to. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come before your throne and we're grateful that you're a God who made us uh, men and women uh, in the image of God um, and that uh, you have created us equally, um, that, that we are of incredible worth and value in your eyes. So much, Lord Jesus, that you came and died on a Roman cross so that we could be reconciled uh, to the Father. And I do pray for uh, the issue of racism in our country. I know that it's practiced and it's practiced at home. It's practiced uh, in many places. And then there are also injustices that are taking place in certain institutions. And so, Lord, we need to be aware and we need to be sensitive and we pray for your wisdom and guidance as we uh, undertake such matters. Uh, thank you for uh, those that, that came out today on the Zoom uh, Sunday School class, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts and minds through this time. Lord, urge us to pray for our country. Um, bring us to our knees so that we depend upon you, knowing what you said in John 15, 5 is true. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And we pray for peace in our land. We pray for justice in our land. And we pray for truth. So, Lord, give us wisdom and guidance. Help us. Also, in the midst of an awful pandemic virus that is taking place, we pray that that would come to a halt and that people would be safe and healthy. So, Lord, um, be, be with those that are grieving, those that have lost businesses, those that have lost loved ones, those that uh, are having a difficult time. Um, we just pray, God, that that your will would be done and that uh, your kingdom would come among us. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.